Yeah, let me give you another variation of this very uh, important theme that was uh, so brilliantly already introduced. So um, I would just, uh, I'm actually not a machine learner by, by training, so I, I probably give you a little bit more of an applied um, view here. And in particular with respect to, to our system science. Um, maybe this is clear to, to everyone. I just want to reiterate uh, the point, and it was made also clear before, that the Earth system uh, in, in particular is a very um, challenging system uh, because it, it is a very complex system combining bio, biological, chemical, and physical processes together. And scientifically, it's also very challenging because it's a unique system, so we can't do multiple experiments like we can do with cells or, or plants uh, and so on and so forth. So we basically often have to rely on the observations instead of being able to uh, make uh, explicit um, experiments. And uh, it's also, of course, a spatial temporal uh, system. And you can see here on the, on, on the right hand side, uh, basically that it spans more than 17 orders of magnitude in terms of spatial scales um, that actually interact with each other in a hier hierarchical way. Um, this uh, actually, this Earth system view, also the view of uh, different spheres like atmosphere, biosphere, um, oceans, and, and cryosphere, basically led also uh, led to this kind of paradigm that is very important. This, this is physical modeling or mechanistic modeling or systems modeling, where um, the system is dissected into different subsystems, like here the physical climate system or uh, the biogeochemical system, then the marine system, the terrestrial systems, and so on and so forth. This is a, is a diagram from the 80s from Chris Bretherton, um, which was basically foundational to, to our system modeling. And um, basically the idea is if we can model the, the subsystems from kind of first principles, uh, and we wire everything um, together, then we will be able to um, uh, describe uh, the whole system behavior. But of course, it's it's um, difficult because we, it's a complex system. And I think the climate modeling community, or in particular, the coupled carbon cycle climate modeling community, um, Learned, uh, learned that lesson already 2006 uh, and then reiterated in this paper by Pierre Friedlingstein 2014, which basically shows how the different models actually predict uh, how in the future uh, land carbon will be taken up. I mean, I can't go into all, all the details uh, of the carbon cycle, but basically the point uh, is, is here um, that currently they kind of agree that there is uh, mostly uh, some uptake of carbon dioxide is roughly a quarter of our emissions. Uh, but if you move into the future, the, the models don't even, uh, um, these complex models don't even um, uh, agree on the sign. Uh, so some say there will be ample uptake in the future and, and others say, oh, there will be even release from the biosphere to the, um, to the atmosphere, which means that it will accelerate uh, the greenhouse effect and, and warming. So these kind of feedbacks um, are obviously uh, not a model with, with high, high certainty, but rather there's quite some uncertainty. And, and this kind of uh, crisis, uh, I think, in the, in the, in the physical modeling of, of, of the climate system uh, let, let us actually to think also about uh, what, we, what we can do about that and basically trying to bring in the same paradigm basically that we need to combine uh, machine learning or deep learning uh, with process uh, understanding uh, in this kind of data driven system science, how I would, uh, how I would call it in, in, in this context. Um, it is also clear um, um, that earth system data is one of the prototypical types of data for, for, for big data. Uh, I'm sure you're pretty aware uh, of that. Maybe I would like to highlight Actually, that I think it is um, it's maybe, maybe indeed quite unique compared to other fields in, in terms of the uh, in terms of a variety because we have so many different data sources. We have point observations at weather stations or all these at equivariance flux stations. We have uh, airplane data that gives us insight over regions, or then the satellite observations, which covers uh, the whole Earth every day or every week or every month and uh, provides us with indirect measurements of processes uh, but um, 
also with, with a huge amount of, of data that is, that is acquired and need to be interpreted. Um, give you uh, one quick example from our own uh, work that is kind of started yeah, almost two decades ago, uh, which integrates um, a bit these different data sources and, and, and shows um, how one can do that. Uh, one type of observations are these local observations of ecosystems that tell, for example, how much carbon dioxide is taken up by the, by the ecosystems. And that operates on a local scale of, uh, of, of one, one kilometer uh, and over several um, decades. So one kilometer is, of course, not the Earth. And even if we have 500 stations, this is certainly not covering the whole Earth. So we need to combine that with, with other information and with, with information that is um, available globally. And the example is, of course, the Earth observation, which observes the whole Earth globally, but maybe not, that doesn't um, directly uh, measure the, the, the variable of interest. So for example, carbon uptake by the ecosystems is not directly measured by the, um, by the, um, by the satellites, but rather states of the vegetation, in particular, the electromagnetic state, uh, state of the, of the um, vegetation. And so basic ideas here to, uh, to use, make use of those two of the information at that intersection of, of, of the scales where both observation systems operate uh, and just use machine learning methods um, to extract uh, the information, the joint information and, and build a statistical model um, to, uh, that then can be applied um, to, the, to the global scale. And so it's nothing else actually than, than, a, than a regression, uh, than a regression model. Uh, it has been, uh, has been, let's say this approach has been leading actually to kind of to the first data-driven, totally data-driven view on what the ecosystems are doing, like in terms of photosynthesis on the upper left or evapotranspiration on the upper right. <clears throat> and then what we could see here is quite uh, plausible patterns derived from the data, from this merging of the data, like uh, active uh, systems in, in red uh, during our, um, our summer in the Northern Hemisphere, we see, but we see also uh, monsoonal systems here in Southeast Asia. And also quite some dynamics following the dry and wet seasons um, in, in the tropics. And then we see co-variation of the water fluxes and central heat fluxes, but that would <laughs> go, go too, too much. Uh, the, the, um, of course, this is just uh, basically, if you want, it's just a black box model and uh, one can do these animations with that and can be happy that one can derive plausible results. But of course, uh, here's already the first plot that shows that we need to use, of course, those how we call upscale data to, to confront that with uh, physically based models. This is one, one example here. And what we can see here, the, the gray is basically our data-driven model uh, with, with the uncertainties. And, and what we can see here, uh, particularly in the tropics, the process-based models of the carbon cycle had a much larger uncertainty than our, uh, our data-driven estimate. And that can then lead to question hypothesis uh, embedded in those models, particularly the, the ones with a high uh, estimate, and that actually happened. Um, and it can then this confrontation with, with the models can then help to improve actually the models and uh, and help um, the science overall. And um, the point that I would make, uh, I, I would like to make actually with these pretty simple machine learning approaches that, that we used, uh, we did not. Um, we didn't really consider uh, dynamic effects or only, we only considered them with hand, some hand design features. So like um, what was the rain over the last three months or last six months. And in addition, also spatial context was not considered. So it was really a pixel by pixel prediction independent of the neighboring pixels. Uh, that probably already rings, rings the bells. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you talk about temporal context and spatial context and uh, we are pretty uh, quickly at, um, at at deep learning uh, paradigms because um, this exactly exploits those those structures. And here in this paper, we just want to make the point, uh, and for many of you, it's probably also very obvious, um, that actually many of the classical machine learning tasks really map into us at science tasks like object classification and localization relate to pattern classification like hurricane detection or atmospheric river detection, drought detection, and so on and so forth. And, and the question of, of downscaling, getting to finer scales from climate uh, forecasts or weather forecasts that are usually uh, not at a 
kilometer or subkilometer scale, um, this statistical downscaling relates, of course, directly to the super fusion, a uh, super resolution and, and fusion in the again in the um, computer vision arena. So these are quite stat static uh, examples, and then we have kind of the uh, I find more interesting even dynamic uh, parts uh, where we want to predict into the future and want to predict um, dynamic systems. Like video prediction is nothing else and forecasting uh, fields of variables over the earth uh, or language translation uh, maps directly to dynamic uh, time series modeling where in both cases often your current um, behavior um, depends a lot on what happened on the context in the, in the past like a word may, might have a different meaning depending on what has been said uh, days um, uh, sentences before and and for the carbon cycle often the uh, trajectory of an ecosystem depends also on whether there have been for example a clear cut 10 years ago or not so very very similar um, thing where legacy and, and history uh, matters let me give you one one example from from our work regarding uh, regarding uh, this part which is again an, of course an earth system question I, I, I like it a lot um, it's better, the question was, but it can we predict whole landscape as, as seen from space? Um, and the idea was basically let's apply basically these pix uh, pix algorithm from Isola et al. Um, to to our system uh, data where you see, for example, climate data is pretty pretty coarse. Um, and the idea would be can we predict a Sentinel two image or two color image, but also um, NDPI image, for example, um, for, for a landscape. Um, and what was interesting to see, um, yeah, it, it works actually quite well. You probably cannot distinguish here what were, were the targets and what, what were the, um, the, um, the predicted or the imagined image with a conditional um, generative adversary network. Um, so the other one is a predicted and, and the lower one is observed. So there's a huge potential of being able to predict the spatial patterns from the core scale um, information. Of course, this is a bit also uh, cherry picked. There are also worse examples. But if you look at, um, at uh, and that's I think important to look at quantitative uh, measures here, like um, uh, how well, um, for example, the fractal dimension or uh, cohesion or, or connectance of patches basically um, relate to Oh, compare uh, the, um, the the target compares basically to, to the predicted ones. Uh, one can see that actually the uh, the gun with convolutions and so on is always um, outperforming any methods that do, don't uh, take into account um, the spatial um, context, like uh, like with spatial um, convolutions, which is not a big surprise, but it's good uh, good basically to, to see that there is actually structural information to be. Uh, extracted even if one has only the core scale predictors. Um, oh, but I, but of course, of course, these, these methods are totally black box, and uh, exactly the question of um, do we understand now what's going on, and, and uh, do we achieve physical consistency is of course uh, not not achieved. Um, so let me let me go into this more dynamic part where I show you a first example how I think uh, one can. Uh, Try to get understanding uh, about the system, and this is about kind of memory effects, dynamic effects. So we would call memory effects uh, that are, are just time varying properties which depend on the past, possibly other latent variables. They are usually described in dynamical systems with differential equations or time discrete um, analog equations. And maybe it's some examples, vegetation development, for example, depends not on the current state only, but on the cumulative temperatures over winter, spring. That's modeled as, as temperature sum, or if you look at soil moisture, a simple water balance will tell us the soil moisture at a per certain state depends on the integral on the of the inflows and the outflows over a certain time. The, the last one is maybe too plant physiological. Um, so this is this is a kind of memory effect, and this kind of dynamic and memory effects, of course, can be well modeled. With uh, um, with a recurrent neural network approaches that are uh, nicely uh, sh shown here by um, well, from, from from the web, basically where exactly we have a state <coughs> that is developing here. This is this, um, this age, and and the state is influenced by by input variables, and together with input variables, it will then uh, produce also an output. 
of the system and that evolves since the state evolves over time also the output evolves over time together with um, with the input x here and then of course it can be compared with a, with a loss function uh, against observations um, I actually convinced myself, I don't know, 2016 or 17 or so on a short sabbatical that this actually works quite well. I won't go uh, into detail, but this is basically, this is basically modeling uh, NDVI time series over uh, so green maintenance of uh, vegetation, so the state variable also over Africa. And uh, colleagues of mine did that with a random forest with very de well designed hand features of drought effects and so on. And I, I just plugged in all the climate logical data and uh, with, with a recurrent new network and got actually quite good um, agreement and, and, and some better agreement even than with the hand designed features. But again, it was a, with a black box approach. And now uh, if you want to understand the system better, for example, we want to understand better where are memory effects, where are historical effects more important than another. We were thinking that uh, work of a PhD student, we thought, okay, what, what if you train the model um, first in a regular way, and then we do a shuffling uh, of, of, of the time series, both the predictors and, and the targets. So basically the temporal structure is, is destroyed. And then we say the memory effect is basically the error we make with a permutation. So the error when the model doesn't have access to all the temporal structure minus the error without uh, permutation. Um, and uh, then one can do that, of course, also by shuffling only blocks of, um, of, of the time series so that there can be access to some memory, like two time steps, three time steps, and so on, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, and that's actually quite interesting globally. We, uh, the prediction uh, of of the NDVI. So where we see memory effects is actually particularly in the in the semi-arid uh, region. So that is indicating that these memory effects um, obviously relate a lot to to soil moisture and and and, and water cycle. Well, um, what we can uh, see here also that um, uh, this is basically the evolution uh, over time. So how long does this memory effect uh, go on? And it actually saturates pretty quickly. So after a couple, couple of months uh, already, which we were hoping that we would see some memory effects carry over effects from the last year, but obviously at least it cannot be detect detected with uh, such a broad approach like with, a, with, a, with, an, with an LSTM. But that's how I think one can extract knowledge about the Earth system by analyzing also the behavior of, of such um, more black, black box approaches. Next step would be to attribute that to specific drivers or, or latent states. Um, last point, last uh, uh, thing, and that I think is really um, the most important, is uh, that um, is really this link between physical modeling and, uh, and and machine learning. It was mentioned in the in the talks before. I think I, I uh, come here actually a little bit more from the systems modeling perspective. Uh, so it's very complementary, um, where we basically say, uh, where we basically have a submodel and the output of one submodel is the input to another uh, submodel. And the submodel, over, the model overall is, is forced with some forcing. So, and, and the models are usually parameterized with some, what I call a meta uh, model here. So this is, could be, the weather model and that could be how vegetation responds to this uh, to this weather and then of course i didn't show that here but there is a feedback uh, can be a feedback as well and we were wondering where in this kind of complex system model which is a climate model at the end can be climate model uh, where um, machine learning can play a role or data data driven uh, approaches can can play a role um <clears throat> well one thing that is of course, can be always done uh, for several reasons. Mo model evaluation, I won't go into, into uh, model emulation, I don't go into detail. What's also interesting, if we don't trust really the output of, of one submodel as uh, for the input of another submodel, we can actually derive a model, um, a drive a model uh, with machine learning output like, like shown here. Um, so it's kind of a modular approach where, where you can maybe test the submodel in a better way by making sure that it doesn't even get <laughs> biased input. The whole uh, thing of model evaluation, which is usually being done with a scatter plot or something like that, or maybe based on frequencies and, and so on and so forth, that can be, of course, much more refined with machine learning methods where one extracts a pattern, a spatial temporal pattern, both in the observations and in the models. So that's nothing else than sophisticated uh, residual analysis if you want 
And, and what is much more challenging and what we alluded to before is also what I would call a hybrid modeling where a full sub model in the Kabbalist model is basically replaced by a model that has learned uh, from, from, machine, uh, from data, so a machine learning based model. And it's actually very similar um, because it's the, let's say, um, the limit and the border, the boundary to a to parameterization model is not always very, uh, very clear, but one could say, well, model parameterization, learning the model parameterization with a machine learning approach would be a similar or a similar approach um, that one um, can do. And it's a question of actually one and two are different uh, or not. It's maybe a more of a philosophical question. The, the point is um, that um, oh, Marcus? the idea, yeah. Oh, uh, we have one question. Uh, yes. So if you can wrap up in a couple yes. minutes, we'll have Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So then, um, yeah. So the, the idea is basically, let, let's go to the right hand side immediately. Um, that, for example, that we basically have a physical model, like a physical diffusion model that tells us how much water is evaporating from the leaves to the atmosphere. Um, that is quite clear. But then we have a se sequence of stomata aperture, how the, what the leaves are doing, and that's much less clear. And why not trying to model that with a with a, a machine learning approach like a recurrent neural network that gives the sequence of stomatal aperture so that kind of the diffusion coefficient of the physical diffusion model and then the diffusion model is applied to then predict the loss of water from the leaves and also the uptake from the leaves. Um, yeah, so I, I, again, I think it's really a complementary approach um, to what was presented before. I believe I will be, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, sorry that I'm a little bit out of time. We have, I have just one quick example sure. from um, respiration modeling, which is very similar. We have a physically based equation here on, on the bottom. Um, and one of those parameters, the basic, the base respiration can be modeled with a machine learning approach. And the idea is basically to, um, to try to infer this latent variable uh, via combining this approach. We have been doing that. It, it's, we get actually very plausible patterns. We even get diurnal um, variation of this physical of this parameter uh, of this space respiration. So that's the idea that we can maybe infer system state that we that are not accessible to observations directly. Yeah, sorry. There's uh, we are doing that currently with a with a hydrological uh, model where we also try to infer states like soil moisture with a totally machine learning based approach on the top and then integrating that into a uh, hydrological model. Um, so again, to achieve this consistency, it also works quite well. <laughs> Sorry uh, for, for that. Um, uh, maybe I go quickly here. So we can basically then with this data driven, if you want data driven assimilation system, um, get get um, root zone soil moisture and anomalies of root zone soil moisture quantities that have not been observed. Um, and yeah, we are just looking into that, how, how it looks very plausible or what we can really gain as, as, as knowledge. And I, I wrap up with the point that I don't want to make the point uh, um, that climate modeling and so is, doesn't, doesn't work, but rather that we should complement this hypothesis driven approach with an observation driven approach. And that at the end, uh, we have to combine these two uh, approaches and um, the interesting things actually come and drive science forward if models don't agree with observed patterns. And that's where we then have interesting puzzles and, and surprises. And we have to do this model data integration. Thanks for your attention. Yep, thank you. Uh, the question is, I am wondering how the modeling of vegetation states you showed varies in different types of vegetation and ecosystems. Yes, um, yeah, it does. it does vary, actually. And it is also a predictor. Um, I um, couldn't go into detail, but it's, it's, it's written up, of course. Um, so basically, uh, the different the vegetation types is, for, is a static predictor. So the, the, the machine learning approach can actually learn that different vegetation types or different climate zones and areas actually do respond um, differently. Uh, I, I don't show this uh, here explicitly. What, what we what we show here is basically different climate zones, so transitional water driven, transitional energy driven. The point is that uh, at this relatively large scale, 0 0.5 degree pixels, one can also look into vegetation types, but often one has very very uh, mixed pixels. So that to look that into that uh, into that in more detail, it's probably very helpful to do um, to repeat these kind of things 
also on the higher resolution where the vegetation types are, are not uh, are not mixed so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, that concludes our first three talks.